Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Potter, uh, Managing Director of Post, Post Productions, and I'm chatting today with playwright Jack Neary, who's a very tender, unique uh, holiday romantic comedy first night will be producing at the Shadowbox Theatre from December 1st to 16th. Uh, hello, Jack. Hello, Michael. How are you? <laughs> Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Likewise. Um, uh, now, before we, uh, before we get into... Uh, you know, nitty gritty details about the play itself. I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit about about you, who you are, um, and uh, and your sort of history as as a writer and as a as a theater professional. How much time do you have? Oh. Uh, no, sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I ah uh, uh, I have been doing this my whole life. I can't retire because I've never had a real job. I've just been doing <laughs> this. Um, uh, I started uh, as a as an actor. Um, I I was a grad student at uh, Smith College, uh, which at the time had a grad program for fifteen men, which was kind of great because they could actually do, you know, real plays with uh, with various ca ca uh, casts in it. Uh, and it w and while I was there, I took a playwriting course uh, from. Uh, uh, pr Professor Len Berkman and uh, realized, oh, look, I think I might be able to do this as well. A in the meantime, I um, I kept acting. I I'm in the union. I I've done lots and lots and lots of plays. Uh, and I started directing uh, at the same time. And I, I spent many years, uh, many summers as an actor and a director and ultimately the artistic director of the uh, Mount Holyoke College Summer Theater, um, where I... Uh, I first, where, where first night was first uh, professionally produced, uh, you know, thirty blah, blah, years ago, <laughs> and uh, so that's kind of, I, I've done. As I say, I've, I've acted on stage hundreds of times. I've been in two or three movies. Um, uh, mainly, however, at this point, somebody asks me, "What do you do?" I say, "I'm a playwright," um, but I still do those other things. I uh, I, I co-founded a, a theater called the Greater Lowell Music Theater about four, uh, about 10 years ago now. That ran for about five years. So I, I produced that. I produced the Mount Holyoke College Summer Theater. I, I co-founded uh, an equity theater in uh, at Smith College, uh, which ran from 1991 to, I don't know, whatever that plus 27 is, um, 27 years um, in Northampton. Uh, I, I was artistic director for six or seven years and then just was a guest thereafter. Uh, so I'm all over the map. And as I as I keep saying to people, whatever pays the bills at any given time. But yeah. basically uh, what pays the bills these days is uh, uh, is playwriting. First Night was my first play. It really was. Uh, it started out as a, a one act play uh, yeah. in a small festival in Worcester, Massachusetts. And uh, the, the core of the story just really clicked big time with the audience. And I said, oh, I have to expand this thing. So that's, you know, without getting into the, the details of the play, that's that's where that came from. But that's basically what I've been doing. I've been doing theater in some way, shape or form for 40 plus years. Yeah, that's a solid career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it is what it is. People say, yeah. well, what would what would you do if you didn't do this? And I would say, I can't do anything else. This is what I do. And, uh, and, and you know, spiritually and physically and everything else, this is what I am and this is what I do. I haven't made a crap load of money at it. Um, and not to say that I wouldn't let it come in if it ever does, but uh, I've been hanging in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that you talked about that I think is really important, especially these days, because the, you know, the industry has changed so much is, uh, you know, that you, you, you had your hand in, in, in many different parts of the, uh, you know, the theater world, right? You were a playwright, you were an actor, you were a director, you founded, you know, um, programs and so forth. And, you know, talking with uh, people in theater here uh, up in Canada, we're not that far up in Canada, we're just across yeah. the river. Detroit you know it's it's really important the the only way you can you can make it a go at it is to ensure that you can do as many of the different jobs that are available as possible absolutely yeah absolutely if you're a technician or a designer you're better off than I am or if you're a stage manager you're better off than I am because there's <laughs> the more, more opportunity for regular work uh, yeah. but uh, if you do a little bit of everything from the creative end of things then 
including administrating, which I've done as a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it it uh, it keeps it together to a certain extent. You have to sacrifice a lot of things. You do, but um, it, it 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 works. It has worked for me at least. Yeah. Now, was theater a passion for you early in life, or is it something that you really got passionate about in graduate school? No, I didn't. I I wasn't in a play. I don't even know if I had gone to a play. No, that's not true. I wasn't in a play on, until uh, college. Um, and then I became, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people who just ends up being in charge of theater things. I don't know why. So I ended up running the drama club and, and, and acting in a lot of plays there. And, uh, then I went to, uh, did a couple of summer theater things, which you do as apprentices and journeymen and things like that. And then I, um, I, uh, uh, one day at Keene Music Theater, I was standing at the call board next to uh, a very attractive woman because I felt like standing there because she was a very attractive woman. And she looks at me and she says, uh, hey, you know, you should go to you should be a grad student at Smith. I said, OK, so <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went, I, I checked it out I, and, and I went to I, I auditioned and I got in and uh, I was there for a couple of years. And while I was there, I don't know, I forget even what you asked me. And while I was there, I. Uh, I met some uh, Jim Cavanaugh and other people at Mount Holyoke College, and that was my affiliation with that. Uh, how did I get into this? Tell me what you asked me. Uh, what What I asked was whether you had a passion for theater early in life before. No, not, I would say I would say not until uh, not until uh, maybe late later in high school and uh, in college. And it was uh, I used to be in a, in a when I was a kid, I was in a marching band uh, in in our Catholic parish. In, in Lowell, Massachusetts. And every year, uh, for many five, six years, uh, I went to, with a band, I went to the, we we marched in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York. And every time we went down, we were there for three days. And I always saw one or two Broadway shows. And of course, that really uh, engendered the, uh, uh, the, 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 the appreciation that I have for, for what I do. So my first experience was with big, big ass musicals in New York. But that, you know, that's really all I needed to get me going. So th that attractive woman who suggested you go to Smith, did you ever see her again? <laughs> oh, she's a Facebook friend. She's always on Facebook. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. She did keep in touch. That's good. To oh, hear. yeah, absolutely. She's she's <laughs> living in Florida. She's living the big life in Florida now, traveling all over the world. Oh, excellent. So you mentioned um, that first night was your first play. Is it something that you started writing while you were in graduate school? I wrote first night when I was 35 years old. Um I got to stop saying things like that because then, then people can figure out how old I am. Uh, but uh, no, I, I wrote that while I was uh, running uh, the artistic director at the Mount Holyoke College Summer Theater. And I, I wrote it um, essentially on a whim because I saw that there was a, a playwriting festival that was looking for, you know, submissions and I submitted it. And, and it was like in, it's probably 45 minutes long at that point. And uh, we did it uh, in Worcester at this festival, and it went extremely well. And the two actors, uh, uh, Mark Cartier and Donna Asali, who were in it, and the, the director at that point, Nancy Kindlin, enjoyed it enough to stick with it. So what we did was, this was very interesting. Well, to me, it was interesting. We put together, I, I, I expanded it. I added another 45 minutes to the play to pretty much where it is right now with variations over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and we did it for one night only in the uh, at the laboratory theater at Mount Holyoke College. It was in the winter. So, but I had already had my summer affiliation with there. So a lot of people knew me. So the place was packed. It was great. But I couldn't go because I was acting in a play in Lowell, Massachusetts. So the very first time this was performed in full length in front of an audience, I was a hundred miles away. So <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway, it, so that's that's that began its uh it's professional life. And from there, it's been on and off for for as long as, as long, you know, for over 30 years, including uh, an off Broadway run, which I have a lot of stories about now, but happy to give her, give those a couple, give you a couple of those, because that's pretty frightening to me, actually. Oh, OK, well, let's talk. Let's let's talk about that then. What, what, what happened during the off Broadway run? OK, so there I am, my early 40s, a new playwright. And uh so uh, actually, we did it in Boston first for a very successful run at a, at a tiny theater in Boston. 
Great reviews. We had a great review from the uh, the the major critic of the Boston Globe with that cut. Uh, he called it. We still use it. He called it a lovely riff of magic, and uh -huh. um, so the, a couple of uh, uh, very nice ladies. One of them I knew pretty well. Another one I didn't. Uh, uh, said, "Hey, we're going to bring this to New York." So they were new producers. They had some money, uh, so they brought it to New York, and they and I pretty much did what we were told this is what you have to do here this is what you have to do there this is what you have to do to get the times this is what you have to do to get the critics blah 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 blah, blah. and so i did so uh, uh it uh, we we went through all kinds of it, it, actually the first two people who were cast or almost cast and one of them was cast remember bruno kirby the actor bruno That's, kirby yeah yeah I, 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 bruno was i met with bruno he was ready to do it Remember, and Cynthia Nixon, you probably know who Cynthia Nixon is too from uh, Sex in the City. Yeah. That the word? yeah. Um, and ran for governor a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> they were they were involved in it. And uh, now there was a television show called The Jeffersons a million years ago. And one of the actors was named Paul Benedict. He played the British guy who lived down the hall. And he was going to be the director and it was ready to go. But as things happen, you know, misunderstandings, blah, 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 blah. Those things kind of eventually fell to the fell to the wayside. So we ended up with a different director and different actors. Hmm. And uh, I don't want to get into too much detail in terms of the personalities, but um, in rehearsal, I was there. I was there all the time. It occurred to I don't know the cosmos or something that the play needed to be done in one act, and one of the actors had a problem with one of the situations in the play. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding the pronouns. I'm doing everything I can here. Uh, right. Situation in the play. Uh, the actor couldn't understand how this could happen in real life. Okay. And so, so rather than being a hard ass, which I wish I had been, and said, no, no, it works. It worked before. Get standing ovations. Look at the lovely riff of magic. It says right here in the Boston Globe. <laughs> um, uh, I cut it. Hmm. And I cut and cut and cut stuff that wasn't understood by the actor. And uh, we went with a one-act play that ran for 62 minutes. It ran for 85 minutes in Boston. And in New York, it ran for 62 minutes. Um, as a result... We had a couple of decent reviews, but the Times, which I've read, nobody believes this, but I've only read it once because I couldn't read it again, was an absolute evisceration of mm -hmm. the play because who the hell was I? This guy, he was just a uh, uh, piece of shit, piece of shit, piece of shit. And, um, and in retrospect, I... I could blame the actor, I could blame the director, and there's a little bit of blame to go around. But ultimately, I'm blaming myself for not sticking to my guns and making it the play that it has become again. I mm -hmm. restored all the all the material, uh, put it back in, and that's in the published version. And even even since that time, I have enhanced it uh, this this way and the other way. Uh, mm -hmm. And now it's back to working uh, the way it always has worked, um, especially since I was able to with one or two little exchanges which i'm sure you have or will use uh well you're using you're changing it in 1995 um i changed i i made i made sure that it took place either in its time which is 85 86 or in a time that would accommodate a video store right uh, that's what that's what it really needs to do um yeah. and the, the and it has the, and it has and it has an intermission i really think that's important uh, like two things you know, the version we're using has the reference to the thursday night lineup right with seinfeld and er so I think that's why, although I'd forgotten, that's why you went with 1995. Um, well, no, but I, when now when we do it, we do Seinfeld and uh, Hill Street Blues. Oh, it's the same thing. It's just get the. Yeah. It's all yeah. Watch there are a couple of there are a couple other tiny things that needed to be changed. But what was surprising about it is how very little needed to be changed. Oh yeah, yeah, I would agree. I you know one thing actually I was going to ask you about because I'm really fascinated by it is that is where the intermission takes place where the act one act two break takes place it's a really interesting point to insert 
an intermission. I mean, can you tell me sort of what, as a you know, as a as a playwright, what what led to the decision to put the intermission there? To put the intermission period, or to put it there? To put it where it is, yeah, right there in, in the script. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It, 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 here's a couple other things. The very first time we did this, yeah, the very first time, we, and I think, I think maybe even in Boston, but the very first time we did this, there were no video boxes. Mm. Uh, uh, everything was mined, and the audience completely bought it. The other thing uh, that was in the earlier versions of this is that when Danny talks to the audience, he froze Meredith like that. Uh -huh. He froze her, uh, and uh, and and it still worked. It worked in Boston. It worked other places, but since that time, I've taken it to the point where Meredith can go off and do her little things, and just take herself out of it for a second, yeah. and uh, and he and he just does his interjections to the audience. So that it makes it all more fluid. As far as where the inter intermission goes is concerned, I. I just don't know. Maybe I said to myself, "Well, that's uh, that's forty five minutes. I think that's enough." Uh, <laughs> uh, but but it's a it's a good place to break because she, she she catches him. She yeah. finally catches him on heavy p, and that allows. And this is what I, in a play like this, not necessarily every play, but a play like this, I like it when the audience has a real good time in the first act, has a real good sharp ending, and then talks about it for ten minutes, and then comes back in and, and picks up picks. They, they add their ideas. To what should happen, what might happen. I mean, they all know what's going to happen until yeah. the, almost near the very end when they get really pissed off at me when she, <laughs> when she when she walks off stage and it looks like she's not coming back. Right, I mean, right. People people get exercised when they see me after the show. Ooh, if you had done that, if you had kept your, you know, um, uh, but they but they know what's going to happen, but they don't know how it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, so they all they have all their their little ideas and. Um, and the, the second act really, really drives because Meredith is Meredith is just on her horse and just she roll she rolls and rolls, 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 rolls until the kiss. Um yeah. and uh so it, it it just works in, in two acts to as far as I'm concerned. I agree. And you know, I remember first reading and I was I was really fascinated by where the intermission was placed. It's a very dramatic moment, right? As you say, she's figured out what he said. Um it's it's mid-scene and and you feel like you know, you want to be propelled into the next part of that conversation immediately. And I kind of like that there's uh, the audience is forced to wait to see the consequences of that, of that revelation. Um, yeah. It really works for me as well. Yeah. And then, you know, the act as a second act, there's a, there's a tonal shift too, as Meredith takes over and starts rolling things along, as you said, it, it, um, it becomes both a more poignant and in a, also kind of a goofier place simultaneously, which I think totally is a very difficult thing to pull off. I don't know. That's kind of like what I do. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you read all my stuff, 65% of it is, is a guy making a decision early that a woman has to fix, that a woman has to fix somewhere down <laughs> the line. Uh, you know, the, the play we're doing right now in West Springfield has been running for five weeks. Um, same basic problem, uh, but it's a whole different story. Um, it's called Moonglow. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, I don't know what. How did I get into that? What was I talking about? Uh, What'd you ask me? Most of your plays are about a guy who makes a decision early. Oh, I, I, yeah, I said that. I don't know what you how how oh, you got me. How we got there was just that uh, I I really appreciate and admire the tonal balance in the second act between this greater poignancy, but also this greater goofiness in terms of the action simultaneously. Well, this is the thing. This is the thing that this is a this is why I appreciate someone like you who gets it by reading it, because a lot of people a lot of no a lot of people read my stuff and they say you can't do that. You can't have somebody say something like that and then turn around and have it be like a serious moment. You can't, but yes, you can. It happens in life all the time. Mm -hmm. But I, I just, I tell you, as the longer I'm doing this, the more I appreciate uh, producers and artistic directors who can read a play and get that because I just don't think there are many who can, and especially when you send something out cold and it's being read by a 19 year old intern somewhere uh, who just doesn't 
really can't relate to something like that, but you really can. There are moments in, in my play Moonglow right now, which is similar in tone in terms of lots of laughs, lots of laughs, lots of laughs, and then boom, changes. But audiences buy it immediately. They really do, especially, of course, if you have actors who can pull it off. Right, right. Yeah, as long as the characters are authentic and the audience is 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 convinced by them, you know, right? They're you can you can get away with all sorts of things. But it's a tricky thing to write too, isn't it? And that's why I think I appreciate it. And maybe one of the reasons I don't see that kind of thing in more scripts. Oh, well, it could be it could be that I'm just ignorant. But it could be that maybe oh. people avoid those kinds of tonal balances because they're difficult to write, even though we we've all experienced them in real life, as you say. Well, you've already proved that you're not in ignorant by choosing my play to do that. Well, oh, clearly. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. I really appreciate it when somebody gets it. I've reached the point kind of where I almost don't have, I have very, very little faith in people understanding my stuff by reading it. I much rather have them come to a reading that I that I control, that I have uh, good actors in and, and, and ha let them hear it and see it. Because I tell you, well, everybody knows, well, everybody who knows anything knows that uh, a play isn't a play until it gets in the hands of actors. And it isn't a good play until it gets in the hands of really good actors. And so far, I've been really lucky uh, with, with the actors that I've had, uh, except maybe in New York. But that was <laughs> that was just a, that was just an incident. It just happened to be in the biggest city in the world. But, you know, what are you going to yeah, do? Unfortunately. Um, yeah. uh, what? Can I ask too? What is it that you cut? Because it's it feels like in retro. Well, then you'll know. Then you'll know which actor I'm talking about. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I was, I was no, it was it was it was it was a lot of the stuff about about um, calling home and and the mother controlling oh, things. Mother, oh, she couldn't really really couldn't understand that. And I I, I didn't get that at all. And, no, and I don't know. I don't know why I cut it, but I did. Yeah, it just felt to me as though when you were relating that story that. In retrospect, anyway, maybe even at the time, you felt you were losing something really important to perhaps not the the narrative, but the emotional heart of the story. Um, I was losing, I, and I lost the audience, and I certainly lost the critics, but I lost the audience in terms of being able to relate to something like that, which they certainly could. Of course, they, they know, they know, they know what I mean. Again, it takes place thirty years ago, um, and they know what it was like. Because let's face it, I don't know what it's like up in Canada, but audiences these days, if you're 65 years old, you're one of the kids in the audience. Um, <laughs> so they really relate to uh, to, you know, what it was like for parents and uh, young people making life decisions and how how a parent cares a lot mm -hmm. about, you know, what's going to happen. They're not going to be around forever. And what's going to happen to my kid? Mm -hmm. And I think Meredith's parents. um you know, oh, certainly her mother uh, really care about and her mother's a big fan of Danny and she wants this thing to happen. Uh, and, and I think the audience really relates to that. And I, and I cut a lot of that out. Yeah. And it, it adds a it adds a wonderful um, dimension to Meredith's decision to, you know, to come to the video store and so forth. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know, as a reader anyway, and, and also, you know, having been working with the script for a while now, I really, I really love that that part of it. In my mind, anyway, the mother also helped with the index cards. I don't know what the intention of was. Of course. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I imagined her sitting down with Meredith and working through these index cards. <laughs> well, when Mer when, in the little video, I said, in Mer when Meredith asks the question, she says, "Ask a sexy question." She didn't write that in. Her mother right, asked that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it comes out so awkwardly for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great decision that she makes too when it comes to what the sexy question will be <laughs> that just happens you know look what what should she ask oh my god what what does vhs mean and audiences <laughs> audiences love that they just yeah. love that you know and the, the other thing that, that works now because audiences they're a little nostalgic about vhs they're a little nostalgic about beta and the people who don't know what vhs or beta is they'll ask and they'll find out yeah uh, yeah, because even yeah. a video store right now is just so uh, unbelievable to to people under thirty. Really, um, uh, one one of my uh, friends a uh, that I work with the Noob Report bought. We had the the the, the set set up that I showed you guys, um, and uh, she brought her her middle school class to walk through. What? 
they had these boxes and you you rented them i mean nobody really relates to it you know yeah now not now it's like dvd what, what is what was that and, you know those yeah. are still I mean, they're all behind me here those are nothing but dvds <laughs> um but but even they're going away you know well, my son's 25 and he has memories of video stores because for, for years they were, well, at least with people like me, a centerpiece of our lives. Um, and he remembers from when he was a child, but there seems to be in his memory and mine, just a point at which they all vanished simultaneously. Yeah. And, yeah. and transformed the way that we watch things. And we were talking about this the other day, actually, you know, generationally, we're very different, but we both remember and miss the experience of browsing in a video nothing store. like it nothing like yeah. it uh, yeah. another, one, one of the things i remember about browsing you had to browse at least in my opinion you had to browse alone if you went with your wife or if you went with your girlfriend there's no way you're going to pick the same run at the same you oh let's try this uh, i don't think so oh, it's, uh, <laughs> you have to go by yourself uh but yeah the video store is I don't know what your set's going to look like, but the, the one that we set up just it just evokes really instantly a memory for um, uh, for audiences. And yet some of the, uh, I mean, the set, I don't even have a picture of it. I don't know why I don't, but the set that the guy created in New York was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you, know, it, you know, it was like he was one of the top designers. We had all kinds of top things going on in that show, except never mind. <laughs> yeah. Things happen. You know, you, and you yeah, can't. It does. It does. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons that we were so excited when we when we read this play, um, which was, gosh, I guess a year and a half, almost two years ago, um, which seems late given when it was written. Um, yeah. Is that we're always looking for a good romantic comedy. And it seems like there are very, very, very few solid romantic comedies for the stage. I mean, some there are some older ones, um, but say post 1980 i guess very very few and and whenever we find one that we think is promising or disappointed and this is the first one that really resonated with us where we thought oh yeah this this one we have to put on there just seemed to be something there's be something very very real in the characters and the way they relate to each other plus we also really liked the the tonal um and you know it's, it's clearly it's text and subtext the homage to the romantic comedies of the 40s and 50s which we love um and uh i don't know if, if you've had this experience i mean i know you you you've written several romantic comedies um do you see that there's a dearth of, of of good choices for that genre on stage as well or is this something that is also part of my ignorance yeah, yes yes there is so everybody should just get in touch with me I have them all. <laughs> perfect, <laughs> uh, because I think the difference is substance. Uh, that's the difference between a, a, a slight romantic comedy, of which I don't know what they are, and and just because I, I I actually uh, the the play we're doing now, Moonglow, which you guys should read sometime, um, is uh, is billed in this particular theater as a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. And if they if they had asked me, I would have said no. It, it's it's a play. It's a play. Right, it's a right. play. And, and but there are laughs and there's romance. So it's a romantic comedy. And they said when I when I asked them about it, they said no. That's going to sell. That's going to sell. I'll say okay. Yeah. And yeah. it has. I don't like crazy. Uh, so uh, yeah, I I just think it's I think it's all about the substance. And I think you know an audience can sit there knowing that they're there waiting for the next laugh, but that's not substantial. But right. if they sit there, if they sit there caring about what's going to happen next, uh, as far as the plot is concerned, and even more importantly, caring about what happens to the person, to the persons on stage telling the story. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's really the difference between, you know, uh, the, the, the good and the bad and the ugly here in terms yeah. of uh, telling, telling a story that has, humor in yeah it. and i would say that's the difference between you know, you know good stories or and bad stories in, in any genre in any medium really uh you think so yeah yeah you know i'm also i'm a, I'm a romantic comedy fan i'm also a horror fan i think that movies suffer from the same problem in that i love these genres romantic comedy and horror but i think most of what's offered um as 
representatives of those genres is awful. But when you find something good, it's it's wonderful. And then that's what makes you fall in love with that genre. Um, but okay, I think- well, this is this is not horror, but I have a play called <laughs> Kong's Night Out. Yes. Have you seen, have you read it? I no, I have not. Okay. Well, it, what it, it it's a play that takes place in the room next to the room where King Kong reaches in and takes Fay Ray out of the bed. Right. Uh, and it's been done a few. It's been done a few times. It was done close to you. It was done in uh, at Meadowbrook up there in Auburn near uh, Detroit. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago with with, with Cindy Williams. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. With horror. I think of my two favorites are, are the you know telling a substantial romantic story and the horror of genre every october i get them all out i watch them all a bride of frankenstein yeah you know what i'm every year every year i'm getting more and more impressed with uh frederick march's uh, jekyll and hyde dr jekyll mm-hmm. and mr hyde it's uh, there's some of those things are just in and, and the, the james whale stuff that oh yeah, uh, yeah. great 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 stuff well, there's almost nothing that looks better in the horror genre still decades and decades later than bride of frankenstein you know just in terms oh. of aesthetic right <clears throat> Well, I have a, in in my play Moonglow now. I have a whole reference to Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, That's I'll one of my. That then. <laughs> I'll, I'll send I'll send it to you. I, I, it's not published or anything. Oh well, thank you. That'd be great. Um, yeah, it's it's. I think true of you know what we refer to as substance. I think it's a good thing to 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 call it. You know that what a story needs you need that that emotional investment in the characters. And you need to care about what happens to them, but also you need to I think understand that you know um the audience doesn't want right term for emotional monotony right so i think the best dramas have you know very funny moments they have they have moments of of lightness right and they have uh there's emotional variety the best comedies have i think very serious dramatic moments oh yeah all stories i think suffer when the audience feels an emotional monotony to the proceedings Oh, I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask some about some some specific uh, details in the play. I mean, first of all, you know that you mentioned this is the first play that you wrote. Why, why this story of the, of these two characters who had this almost it wasn't even a it wasn't even eighth grade fling even by eighth grade standards a crush that they neither would admit to each other um and in the eighth grade who who reconnect after they've both taken these very different paths is there something that 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 made that kind of setup resonate with you or did you start somewhere else and that came along later i think i started as i do quite often with an actor in mind um do you do you know who marianne plunkett is i don't think so well, she's she's a New York actress. She's been in a lot of stuff. She won a Tony for me and my girl a million years ago. She was a friend of mine uh, in Lowell. And, uh, you know, I just thought she was the bee's knees. And so I wrote First Night with her in mind. And, of course, I put myself into it. I did First Night once when I, you know, 30 years ago. I I, I was I was in it once. Um so it was me and 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 Marianne and 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 then I said, okay, what kind of a situation? And who knows how that situation came about? I mean, I was a big video guy, big 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 mm-hmm. video store guy. And I said, well, this is this. I haven't seen this on stage yet, so let's put let's put them in there and see what happens. And what 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 could be, my uh, playwriting teacher, Len Berkman, says you, the, your play is uh, one character wants something, another character wants something else, and they they, they clash. That's that's the <laughs> so she's a nun. And he and he does and he and he's afraid to add, he's afraid to to break through, especially with this particular person. So it just sort of evolved. I don't remember. I didn't sit down and conscientiously, you know, say or consciously say this is this is going to happen. This is going to happen. It just sort of just sort of happened. And interestingly, when we were in New York, the first person cast after actually with Bruno was Marianne. Oh, <laughs> and really? then she and then she called yeah, and then she called me up and she says, uh, just found out I'm pregnant. Can't do oh. it. So, so she, she, so she, she couldn't do it. Uh, but I also had in the back of my mind, though, um, you know, thinking about eighth grade and how the the hormones begin to, you know, cur- curdle. What's that? That curdle isn't the word. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> um, and, and I, I just remembered physically, uh, this uh, girl, and her name was Martha O'Connor. So that's where the name came from, and probably the M in her name as well. Yeah. Uh, and about 
three three years just before COVID, we were doing first night at home in Lowell at the Merrimack Repertory Theater just for a weekend. And she showed up. So this is like 40 years later or 50 almost and and, and I'm saying, Martha, you're the person that physically I based this person on. Um and so she was blown away by it, which was kind of cool. She still looks pretty good. Um was she, so was she, it was just a, just a, a mix of, of of all kinds of different. I never written a play before, really. I've written wrote a couple of sketches and stuff for Len, but uh, I had never written a a, a a a complete play before, and it just sort of came together. As I say, it came it came together incrementally in a forty five minute piece, and then adding another forty five, actually another forty minutes to it. Yeah, um, but it just sort of came incrementally, and since that time. Um, the, the 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 basic approach has been pretty much the same, usually starting with an actor, uh, and and just what kind of a story can I tell using that talent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that approach. And you know in, what you talked, what you mentioned regarding eighth grade. I think that's another aspect of the play that you know, regardless of what happens in the story, and I. I I've always sort of bristled at this idea that everything in the play has to be relatable. I don't think it has to be relatable. I think it has to be understandable. Um, mm -hmm. But this eighth grade experience, right? The, the, those first sort of rumblings and the, the awkwardness of all of that and the, the various fears and anxieties that accompany it and so forth, that comes across so authentically. And surely there isn't a person in the world who can't relate to that in some way. <laughs> who doesn't no, know absolutely it's like yeah Jay straight that makes makes no difference no it's it's yeah absolutely true. yeah it's absolutely um was uh was uh martha flattered oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> she's she's come she's come to two or three of my shows since then she still thinks it's her favorite play. well yeah well of course she would think it's her favorite play. yeah what choice does she have <laughs> but she was also she was also there with uh, another guy that was in my class at that time they had gone off and had their own lives and married other people and then came together you know it oh, just wow. happened yeah that's neat that's neat um one of the other things that you know really appeals to me and i i i, I love i love a good story i mean for me a, a good story that's driven you know propelled by character decisions as far as you know is the main thing but you know you always want something to reflect on afterwards too that that emerges from the narrative right the subtext the themes and so forth and what you have here i think I mean, the way I look at it, the way I understand it is this really interesting convergence or intersection um, thematically of, you know, the idea of dreams, you know, these, these, these things that we, that we pine for that seem out of reach or that, that we, in one case, for instance, think um, are too dangerous to pursue, but in other case might propel us right forward we might be driven to pursue them you have the dreams on the on, on the one hand on the other side you have this this idea of potential and you have this interesting moment right in, in the second act where we we really come face to face with the difference between what someone sees as their own potential and what someone else may see as their potential yeah. and how those things affect each other is that something is that a, is that a uh, a tension, a, a convergence, or a conflict that you felt in your own life? Do you think that subconsciously entered the story? Is this something you've pursued in other stories? I don't think there's anything in my play, especially in this one, that that, that hasn't converged with my life in turn. Oh yeah, uh, I have a lot of plays, not a lot of plays, maybe two or three, where the the main character, um, no, even in Moonglow, Jesus, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, I, I I create something near the end of the play that needs to be physically uh, addressed. In Moonglow, near the end of the play, one of the characters says to another character, "Open the bag," and and I and the 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 guy is has this bag, and the audience knows that the answer to all his problems is in this thing, and he keeps he keeps refusing to open, refusing to open it. You know. And I, uh, I have that's happened two or three times in different plays of mine. So that that's that is a theme uh, is this this like inability, refusal to uh, allow wonderfulness mm. to happen. Right. I right. think that's a I think, you know, I'm, I'm doing like a you're like my psychiatrist. here. I think that's a big 
thing with me. And it probably still is. Yeah. I'm 115 years old and I'm still waiting to open the bag. Um, <laughs> but but I but I do it on stage. And when it happens on stage and and the character does do this and the audience is just, oh. in Moonglow, we're getting physical. We're getting vocal responses to it. It's oh, it's 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 really a little wonderful when it happens so so it, it happens a little time for me every time it happens in a play <laughs> what it yeah, it's a wonderful thing uh, hearing those vocal responses to something like that from an well, like in, in 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 first night it's um it's 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 the kiss yeah um, and that kiss this i don't know how they can how i can explain this but that, that that kiss is kind of based on uh the 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 kiss at the telephone in it's a wonderful life with jimmy stewart and donna reed uh mm -hmm. he's fighting he's fighting he's fighting he's fighting he's fighting and she's 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 holding on holding on holding on holding on he finally he drops the phone and they they embrace and yeah. i th and that's what's happening in that moment uh in my mind anyway it's the same thing and that's that, that's the that dynamic that I love in the classic romantic comedies, and you know a lot of which are referenced in uh, directly in First Night, is that combative style of flirtation and courtship. You know that they have even in movies like Holiday Inn and White Christmas. It's oh yeah, right. And and it seems like they at, at times that they they, they even hate each other, um, and then. It, there's a, but if you understand the characters there's always that that sense underneath that you know right you know that that really they're pining for each other and something is is getting in the way it's it's forcing them to to sort of con contort themselves not to acknowledge it but eventually right exactly full enough to push through well what's 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 important directing it a a, a, a get the great actors b when they start to get angry you just have to remind them they know it you just have to remind them that each of them loves the other one yeah and and whatever whatever that anger is the audience needs to see it through the the, the the technique of a brilliant actor um to make sure that the anger is with eyebrows up as opposed to this it's 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 yeah. such a weird technical thing it's it's unbelievable yeah. um but but it's 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 really it's really true. And because they say, not necessarily in first night, although they they get kind of hard at at each other a couple of times. But in other places, I've they said pretty serious things. And um, but you just have to make sure that the audience knows that they're covering something up. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that's I think that's set up really well in first night. I mean, by the end of, I mean, honestly, by a few pages into the first act, you understand very much um, Danny's feelings towards Meredith. Oh, and yeah. Meredith, you know, she's a little harder to to figure out at first, but it comes through. And uh, and and the key moment for me is before things get really combative between them. Um, you know, when they start throwing things and so forth, we have that beautiful moment where Danny starts pushing her away. And I find that so devastating, that moment. And that, I think, that moment is the key to the under... It's like, this is like just, this is like two or three pages. This, this is just before the, the 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 big fight, right? Yeah, yeah. Near the end, and, and he he's saying, they're dreams, Meredith, and what do you, you just, you, you, you live, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. Does, and, and again, I, I, I just have, right now, the little production I have, they're the, oh, I, well, I'm not going to say it, but they're tremendous actors and when and the when i'm watching this scene really for the first time uh and i've directed it eight million times um these guys showed me how you can play that scene and show all that emotion and all that uh that abandonment of the of the comedy and 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 still get it back mm -hmm. um yeah, they, uh, they, it's, it's, I really, it, it showed me how much I really love that scene. I mean, I really <laughs> like that scene. You know, I love it. I love it. That's, that's probably my favorite moment in the play. For me, it, it just, it hits me right in the gut. It hits me right in the gut that moment because you know, this is, this is everything he doesn't want to happen. But he honestly, you know, from his own perspective, given his own self loathing, thinks this is the kindest thing to do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 
That's right. It's beautiful. I mean, and sad. Be, be, because you're Meredith O'Connor. That's why. That's why yeah. I, I can't. Yeah. Because, yeah. She's too good for him. <laughs> <laughs> as far as he can, as far as he's concerned, right? And she always right. has been. And one of the wonderful things I love about the story is is the difference in, in the trajectories of their lives based on their view of themselves. You know, and Meredith catches on to that. Meredith sees that. Um and sees how Danny has held himself back because of his his own poor conception of himself. But she was driven to become a nun because of her own confidence and her own belief in herself and then discovered as one often does, right? When we take a certain track in life, Hey, maybe that's not for me. Maybe I'm going to try something else, but yep. she had confidence to pursue it in both cases. Whereas he really hasn't had the confidence to pursue anything because he sees himself as not only so far beneath Meredith, but so far beneath probably all the kids who picked on him for being the little fat kid. Yeah. 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 Devastating. <laughs> it's devastating and that's what makes it i think that's what makes the humor so much it hits me so much harder because it's that it's that that uh um what do you call it that um that contrast right that emotional contrast you're when you when you're in that low point and you're feeling for for them and you're feeling their loneliness and their pining and you're aching for that relief when the comedic bits come they they just hit you so much harder and that's why audiences get really pissed off at me when she walks off near the end and doesn't come back. And you think she's not going to come back. They Which should. I kind of, I kind of like, I'm, I usually stand in the back of the audience <clears throat> and I can, I can hear their anger and their, <laughs> I don't know. And, and, and I just say to myself, gonna be, in one minute, they'll be fine. They're going to be fine. Yeah. In one minute. <laughs> <laughs> they won't hate me forever. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know if you've ever thought of this or if your actors said anything. The, 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 I usually get early in rehearsal. Are they really going to hum? Is the audience going to hum? And my answer is absolutely they're going to hum. Yeah. Absolutely. Every time. They love it. They love stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they'll be they'll they'll, they'll be so emotionally part of the action at that point. You I hope. Yeah, 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 that's the point. Yep, I can't see point. any resistance at that point. Well, I mean, thank you very much for this conversation. Um, hey, I, want to, I, want to, I want to ask you one thing. Yeah. Uh, at, at the beginning of the show... Where are you in rehearsal? You're opening up pretty soon, right? Yeah, we open on Friday. Okay. Well, what are you <laughs> using, what What are you using as a movie for him to watch at the beginning? It's a movie for him to watch at the beginning. Oh, through the through the window. Oh, the it doesn't little TV. It... the little TV? We have we haven't actually settled on that yet. The audience doesn't see the TV image, but we're having you know the audio. Um, we haven't. What, what's the that What's what the you... Oh, well, here's what I use, and I love it. I use the last couple of minutes of Billy Wilder's The Apartment, uh, which takes place on New Year's Eve. Yeah. See if you can, at the end of it, uh, just before uh, she uh, Shirley MacLaine is sitting with Fred McMurray on New Year's Eve, and he tells her, that you, "This isn't. In, this isn't. I don't. Know, I don't. I forget exactly when we started, but it, it involves. She decides to run." Uh, to uh, to Jack Lemon's apartment, and and then they have the last little exchange, uh, which which ends up shut up and deal. Uh, but it has this big, big movie musical uh, uh, soundtrack going with it. If you get a chance, look at the end of it, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's it, I start it. Uh, maybe I, maybe I can send you the the beginning of the the video or something like that. Oh, it it really works perfectly, and it also uh, the way we did it. Um, I, I add a little thing just before as he turns off the movie. Ah, uh, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> that's that's what that that's what I use. You do whatever you want, but that I just use the end of uh, uh, Billy Wilder's The Apartment. It takes it's a New Year's Eve movie. Yeah, and some people, some people in the audience, re, uh, uh, recognize it. Some oh, yeah. people don't. Doesn't make any difference. Yeah, yeah. Any difference. As long anyway. as they understand the feel of it. I mean, you know what? Yeah. That gives me an excuse to watch it again because I think the last time I watched it, I was twelve or thirteen. It's been a long which, time. Which, which, the apartment? Yeah, the apartment. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just think it's genius. Um, and the thing of it, it's it's interesting because when it came out, I was also a kid and I didn't I didn't watch it, um, because it was banned by the Catholic Church. Because it's but it's about a guy who gives his apartment over to uh, people in in his office to so they can have sex, and of right. course, Catholics don't have sex, so that that's uh, <laughs> that's why they banned it. 
Um, but I, I've watched it since then, and it's one of my favorite. And the ending is so romantic. If you what, if you watch, um, for lack of a better phrase, romantic comedy movies, how many times the person who doesn't quite get it gets it just before the end of the movie and runs yeah. to the other yeah. character. Yeah. Oh, it's him. It, it just it, it's happened movie after movie. Anyway, yeah. if you get a chance, take a look at it. You know? I will. You know, actually we've been we've been trying to watch um just as part of our process and because it's fun, all of the movies referenced in the play. Um, you know, over the last month or so. It's been uh, it's been really fun to go through that and uh and to be reminded of why these things are mentioned too. And you know, a lot yeah. of the well, there's a couple I haven't seen. Um, and there's a lot of them that I have seen, but not for a very long time. Then there's ones like the, well, all the Christmas ones you've mentioned, I've seen many times. Um, and it's, yeah, the apartment, of, it'd be a great excuse to watch that again too, maybe tonight. Um, I was going to ask- about The Quiet Man? Have you watched The Quiet Man? Not yet. No, not yet. I, <laughs> here's my confession. My confession is I avoid John Wayne and, uh, and I'd forgotten about The Quiet Man. And so I've been putting it off, but yeah, we're going to watch it before Friday. It's <laughs> one of the two or three best John Wayne movies, John Ford, Maureen O'Hara. It's I mean, interesting I mean, though, because of the, because of the way John Wayne treats Maureen O'Hara in this movie. The first, one of the times I did it, I, I had my actors go look at it and they said, you wanted us to watch that? <laughs> because he, he just he's John Wayne. I'm sorry, he's John Wayne. Yeah. But there's this but there's some there's some romance to it too as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he's got watch some good ones too. The searchers, true grit. I mean, he's he's got some he's got some good ones in his in his catalog there. I was gonna ask yeah. you um before we go too, I forgot your touring production that you're doing right now, are you touring all over New England or where are you touring? No, no, I I I say touring because we move it. We've moved it a couple of times. We actually haven't done it in a year, but just just after COVID or yeah, just after COVID, we did it about five or six different places. We it's not it's not officially booked or anything. We just find a theater and do it oh. because I have, as I said, I have these two actors which are they're just freaking brilliant. And um, uh, so we, I'm I'm actually going to rehearse it only three or four times before we do it this time because <clears throat> they've done it before. So it's not an official thing. After this New Year's, we may we may never do it again. I have no idea. Oh. You know? I mean, but it's it's wonderful that you have these actors who are willing to do this too. That's fantastic. I'm gonna use. I'm gonna lose at least one of them, or probably both of them, to the union pretty soon, and then I have to really start paying them a lot of money. But you know, yeah, what are they gonna do? <laughs> that's that's our lot. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, sir, and I really appreciate the conversation. And thank you for writing the play and for for allowing us to enjoy it and produce it. Oh, I'm thrilled you're doing it. I'm glad. I love to hear uh, people like you talk about these things because uh, I, I I just don't. I just don't hear it that often. And I, I know I know that there's substance in my stuff. And I just wish that uh, there were more people like you who could read it and get it. It just doesn't happen that often. Well, there is there is definitely a substance. In it, and I'd love to read Moongle if you if you're willing to share it. I will. I'll, I'll click that off to you. And there are other there's another one called Jerry Finnegan's sister, which you might like to. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Have a good show. Thank you. All right. Thank you.